So let me officially begin this event. I'll introduce myself. I'm Kathleen Leibowitz, and I'm one of the community directors for Toward Zero Waste Raleigh. This event has been co-sponsored by two great organizations, Hungry Harvest and Toward Zero Waste. The work both of these groups do complement each other in such a positive way. Hungry Harvest's main mission is to eliminate food waste and eliminate hunger, while Toward Zero Waste's mission is to see a North Carolina where individuals, families, businesses, and local governments are mindful of the waste they create and take active steps to drastically minimize landfill contributions. Let me take the time before we show the movie to introduce the rest of the team that worked hard to make this screening happen tonight. Um, our co-founders of Toward Zero Waste, maybe you can raise your hand. Um, we have Dargan Gilmore and Lee Williams. Then we have two new Toward Zero Waste volunteers that have agreed to be community directors, one in the Charlotte area, that's Rachel Clark. Then we also have one in the Greenville area, which is, her name is Jada Morris. We're very excited to have them. Our other wonderful volunteer is Greg Couch. He is a Toward Zero Waste board member and our excellent media guru who helps us with everything. Um, from Hungry Harvest, we have Callista Pop. She's the finance coordinator at Hungry Harvest. Um, we'd also like to thank all the volunteers with Toward Zero Waste. We are a volunteer driven organization and we could not continue our mission without our volunteers. So I'll put a plug out there. If you're interested in volunteering, please go to the website and fill out a form under the volunteer tab and we'll be in touch with you how you could volunteer with us. Um, let's see. Now I'm going to introduce the movie and it is called Just Eat It. And the main part, um, it's food waste. This is the description of the movie. Food waste is a huge waste of resources and a huge producer of carbon. Uh, additionally, one in 10 people in our country are food insecure. Documentary filmmakers Grant Baldwin and Jenny Rustmeyer dive into the food waste issue by pledging to quit grocery shopping cold turkey and survive only on foods that would otherwise be thrown away. Just Eat It is a result of their food waste journey. So now the movie lasts 50, 55 minutes, so we can all watch it together and then we will um, meet our um, panelists and um, you can put questions into the chat or you can as you can put questions in as they come up in the chat and we will try to have our panelists answer them afterward. Um, has, are we ready? Is Greg ready to start the movie now? Ready whenever you guys are. Okay, I think. Thank you, Greg, so much for looking into that. Um, now, um, we've all seen the movie, I bet kind of thought provoking, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat, because now we have our panelists ready to answer the questions. So do you just put those questions um, in the chat? Let me introduce our panelists. Our first is Allison Bauer. She works with Hungry Harvest. Um, let me get, tell you a little bit about her. Allison Bauer studied leadership and sustainability at Stanford University and is now overseeing field market management nationally for Hungry Harvest, a farm to door produce delivery company that pioneered the ugly fruits and vegetables movement. In just the last few years, Hungry Harvest has connected over 26 pounds of oddly sized or shaped fruits and vegetables to customers seeking more affordable access to fresh produce while donating over 1.5 million pounds more to local hungry, hunger relief organizations. That is Allison. Then our, our next um, panelist is David Balder. Is Kathleen frozen for everyone or just me? Yeah, I think she's frozen. Well, I can just introduce myself briefly. 
Um, I'm the co-founder, co-owner of Crown Town Compost in Charlotte. Uh, we're a small scale compost company, pick up food waste from mostly houses, but also restaurants. Um, and obviously big advocates of reducing food waste before we ever have to compost it. Awesome. And I think next we were going with Brandy. Hi everyone, I'm Brandy Williams, Community Engagement Manager for the City of Charlotte Solid Waste Services. And, um, you know, David and I have worked together. We did um, a curbside food wasting uh, composting pot, a curbside food waste composting pilot um, in 2018 and 2019 to kind of test the water for what could be possible if we looked at adding that as a, another service offered by the city of Charlotte. Awesome, thank you. Um, and so Representative Zach Hawkins is also gonna be joining us. He's um, running a little bit late coming from another, um, another um, event, virtual event tonight, but I'll go ahead and, and introduce him as well. Um, and hopefully he'll be on in a minute. If not, we'll just, we'll just go on with things. Um, so Zach Hawkins represents House District 31 in the North Carolina General Assembly. Representative Hawkins has received his BS in biology from Elizabeth City State University and a master's in biology from North Carolina Central University. In addition to serving as a teacher at Bur Durham Public Schools, he has experience as a, de a development and advancement professional in nonprofits such as the United Way and in higher education institutions like East Carolina University, Duke University, and UNC. In 2020, Representative Hawkins introduced the Food Waste Reduction Act, House Bill 1119. So we will have questions for him about that. And with that, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. And you guys, please um, put questions in, into the chat um, for our panelists. A little bit of a quiet audience tonight. So we'd love to, love to hear from you guys and would love to hear what you thought of the film um, as well. I am going to start with David of Crown Town Compost. David, several communities across the country are focusing, focusing on residential compost programs in order to divert food scraps and other organic materials from the landfill. Are there currently any plans uh, to partner with the city of Charlotte to develop a municipal composting program? Um, so I'll start and I'll certainly uh, refer to Brandy as well as uh, City of Charlotte Solid Waste representative. Um, so in terms of a residential or commercial food waste collection program, there, there are no current plans for that in Charlotte um, that we are involved with um, on the private side. But um, we are partnering with, with the city and with a local nonprofit called Envision Charlotte to, in a pretty cool uh, kind of circular Charlotte initiative where we'll be piloting um, black soldier fly composting as kind of a higher use of food waste than um, traditional composting. So I'll leave it at that. We can talk about that maybe a little more later, but I don't know if Brandy wanted to say anything about your question. You're muted. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for tossing that to me, David. Um, I guess I want to respond to that by just simply saying at the, at the moment, there are no plans for adding curbside residential food waste program. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the things that you guys uh, are going to ask later, and I don't know if I should go ahead and answer it now or not, um, but essentially there are challenges to that, right? So if I think we have to do a little more education to help people understand the idea and the issue around food waste. And so the way that we even came to doing the composting pilot with David was we were looking at how we could reduce landfill waste. And we um, started to think about what it looked like to pull together a program that, that used health as a motivation to get people to reduce their waste. 
And so the, the name of that program was Healthy Communities. And as that program started to develop it developed and we moved through it, we recognized how much uh, or how big composting and food waste was. So with it being the number one thing that um, that's in residential food, I mean, residential garbage, we wanted to figure out how we could take that out. But also as the, as the film discussed, it has negative environmental impacts. And so we started to educate the community on that and then develop this program called Food Too Good to Waste, where we challenged them to reduce their food waste at home. And so that led us to thinking about what could it look like if we did start a curbside residential food waste program I think, you know, the biggest challenge to that, though, is just, again, really helping to reframe the idea that um, we're going to get a lot more from a food waste program than we will with recycling. And if you, you know, think about the recycling markets with where they are right now and um, that we need to start to help people really understand that we, we should make a pivot um, with where we're going to get, a, to get more bang for our buck. If I could just add one thing, um, the direction of our company, we're, we're moving towards curbside uh, compost bins or 24 gallon wow. and um, they'll be picked up every other week. So it's a win, win, win for us. You know, we're, we're not going to be cleaning gross buckets anymore. So <laughs> sorry, customers. <laughs> um, we are picking up every other week. So we're cutting our transportation in ha virtually in half. Um, and um, yeah, I think it just it, it makes it more of a norm versus having this you know this special bucket which is what we use now. It's just not, it's not special, but it goes in your house. And you got to take it out every week and treating it more like your normal residential trash and recycling. So kind of make it more part of the routine, like like you see in a lot of cities that do have municipal programs. So we see a demand for it out there. We think um, the reason we don't have ten thousand customers yet is is a, just normal marketing troubles, um, and we're headed that way. Right. Awesome. Yeah. And so I think that's what it's about, right? Changing, changing the social norms and whatever towards your waste and Charlotte can do to help um, both of you, the city of Charlotte and, and private composters um, get the word out about composting. That's what, that's what we want to do. We definitely want to, want to get people thinking that that's a, that's a normal thing to do and that throwing away food is, is not normal. Um, and Representative Zach Hawkins has joined us now. We did already introduce you. Thank you for coming. We know you're busy, um, but I just wanted to let everybody know that he's here. And then I'm gonna move on to a question for Allison. Um, Allison, many of our personal experiences with food waste um, are that which we have at home. So when we, when what we see wasted at home is, is usually all we see. Can you share with us something about the amounts of food Hungry Harvest recovers that would have otherwise gone to waste? Yeah, of course. So first, if anyone doesn't know what Hungry Harvest is, we are a rescued produce delivery service. So what we do is we get all the food that you guys saw that was going to waste from farmers, home, se home sellers, etc. And we get this food at a discount and then we deliver it to your homes at a discount. So it's less than 20% um, off of grocery store prices. It's convenient um, because it gets delivered right to your door and you are saving so much food. So we have three different size boxes, small, medium, large, um, all ranging in prices um, starting at $15. We have organic and non-organic and you can customize your box and we have grocery items as well. So all good stuff there. So, you know, as to combat all of this too and all the things that we saw, 40% of all food goes to waste in this country. We have delivered over 26 million pounds of oddly sized uh, shapes and fruits and vegetables to customers just seeking more affordable access to fresh produce. And then we've also delivered over 1.5 million pounds to local hunger relief organizations, such as Interfaith Food Shuttle and Raleigh. Very cool. And so I think, did so you're seeing the food coming from grocery stores, farmers markets, yeah, so um, we actually get it before, like, so uh, as we saw in the film, they only want the most aesthetically pleasing uh, fruits and vegetables. So it doesn't even get to the grocery store. They don't want it because it's either too big, it's too small, maybe a pepper is misshapen, like the carrots aren't perfectly straight. So it doesn't even make it to the grocery store because they don't want it. So 
some of the places that we get it from are farms, um, you know, fruit and veggies that don't need a specific, you know, again, with the size, the color, the weight, or service blemishes that get sorted out and left in the field. Um, and then also strong seasons with higher than expected yields uh, lead to surplus uh, produce that doesn't have a home in the retail market. Also at packing houses, uh, many grow growers harvest their entire crop and have it sorted out at packing facilities. So um, fruit and veggies that don't need a very specific spec get sorted out and are destined for waste. And also, also wholesalers. So wholesalers periodically find themselves with access inventory that they need to move and without a buyer, this produce will also go to waste. So produce that arrives at a wholesaler but doesn't really meet those retail customer specs often go to waste and if another buyer can't be found. So those are some of our way, um, where we get them from. Okay, awesome. So Representative Hawkins, um, when we introduced you, we, we talked about your schooling and everything you've done, but we also um, talked about this very exciting item um, and that's ha House Bill 1119. And so many of our listeners have not heard of this. Can you tell us, um, tell us a bit about it and help us understand how we can support it? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll cut to the second part first. Is you can descend on Raleigh in the state capitol when it is safe to do so, because um, a bill of this kind, as everyone has mentioned uh, on the on the phone, they're doing you know the work in, in different pockets, but we need to create statewide systems that allow us to reduce um, food waste across North Carolina. Um, North Carolina is number nine in U.S. population, and over the next decade will be number seven. And that's two things that you need to take away from that. First, um, that's a lot more waste that can be generated. Uh, secondly, that means there's potentially going to be a lot more hungry people. And so the way that um, this bill, the Food Waste Reduction Act, helps to, um, uh, to get in the way uh, of, you know, the, 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 amount of, the amount of money lost and the amount of food that's wasted is that, you know, by making sure that uh, we require, you know, uh, restaurants, supermarkets, hotels, stadiums, other big generators who are uh, generating an annual uh, average of two tons per waste of food waste per week. We want to make sure that if they're within 25 miles of an organic recycler, they have to, um, just like you just saw in New York, um, they have to have um, that, uh, uh, they have to make sure the excess food goes for human consumption first, if it can, which generates a um, the potential for industry. And so we have Gooder, or if you have heard of them, G-O-O-D-R, they're one of the partners and one of the thought leaders around this topic with us, they're down in Georgia. And so they have the ability to take food in a refrigerated um, way and make sure that it gets to individuals and to you know, other spaces that need it. And so that it creates an industry which we have to because no food should go um, to waste. Um, so the, the other, other piece um, is not for, first for human consumption, but if all practical, we wanna make sure that it goes for animal feed. Um, we, number one, the number one economy, uh, part of our economy is ag in North Carolina. And so uh, we have a lot of, a lot of animals um, in, you know, in ag and in other spaces that could absolutely use it, compost, ethanol production, et cetera, right? So all of those things sort of down the line. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, if, if, we can, if we can pull this off and incentivize businesses um, through the process, um, in North Carolina, I think it's, you know, I forget the exact number of, of billions of meals that are wasted, but we can, we can really fundamentally change the way that um, people, especially in urban areas, um, get access to food, but most certainly in smaller economies. There are a lot of people, as, you know, many of you have talked about, and on the call I was just on before, talk about the, the poverty and the, the hunger that exists. Um, and not to mention the, um, the extreme... Uh, pressure that, that puts on landfills, right? And the amount of stuff that just sits there and rots when we could be doing a whole lot more with it um, and saving our environment at the same time. And so this um, is funny enough, I'm an, a former environmental science teacher and uh, it's funny how your past follows you um, because this, this is something that for me is a game changer for our state. And I think that if you live outside of North Carolina and uh, I mean, not outside, but if you look outside of Raleigh, um, the biggest thing you can do is contact your representative. We're, we're talking right now with um, you know, members of the, the, the majority party and people in the restaurant industry and people um, in waste management 
so that we can get all of our players together so that hopefully this bill will have a chance of moving through and passing the House and then finding a champion for it uh, in the Senate. And so if you have anybody that you think could remotely be involved in this, we would love to add you to our stakeholder team. Awesome. Well, we, we, we definitely want to help. And so what we'll do when we send out a follow-up email is we'll get the information from you and um, just tell people exactly what they need to do, write letters um, to whomever or um, the verbiage. We'll give them the, the verbiage that they need. Um, there is a follow-up question. Um, how has COVID affected HB 1119? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so excuse, uh, I have a four and a six year old. Uh, that <laughs> this is bedtime. So that's not always a pretty process for parents out there. Right. Um, but, you know, the thing that the thing that, that has affected it and the reason we've had to be a little sensitive uh, to is because if the restaurants aren't producing uh, as much product, then there's not as much waste. Right. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we sort of knew what the um, uh, what the uh, the economy would look like and, you know, what how that part of the economy would uh, would recover. But we still kept the conversations open with their advocates. So the conversation has not gone dead. It's just that we have not, we didn't necessarily feel like it was appropriate uh, during the pandemic um, to put pressure on those. But by thinking about and highlighting the fact that hunger has been exposed, I mean, it was already exposed, but even exposed even further has opened the conversation with a lot of people. So we, we've not necessarily put as much pressure on the industry because they're thinking about how they're gonna survive. But for the people who are advocating, we've kept the conversation open and shown how this um, can be um, a, uh, a place where everybody wins after we get back to normal. Right, gotcha. Okay, uh, moving back to Brandy, you have an important role directing community outreach and educational programs in order to improve recycling rates and reduce waste. What current challenges does the city of Charlotte face in terms of food waste? I think you're still muted. Yeah, um, so I think that the biggest challenge is that the food waste is still going in, in the garbage. Um, and then the, the other challenge is really figuring out a way to make the process of food waste in the garbage socially unacceptable and giving people an avenue to um, be able to manage that food waste. So because our focus is on residential, we very, we're very we looking at how do we help reduce the amount of food waste that people are putting in the garbage. Um, so as I was preparing for this, I thought about growing, you know, when I grew up and it was very unacceptable to waste food. Um, my grandmother would tell us that there were hungry kids in Africa that would love the food that you are not eating. Like, I don't know if any other black people um, had that same guilt trip placed on them, but it was always, you're not wasting, right? You're not wasting any food in this house. Um, and, but I think, you know, for, so for me, it was always cultural, but I think the, because now my kids don't have that same fear. I didn't place that fear in them, one, because I didn't like the way it felt. Mm -hmm. But two, I think for us, it was always, it was also an economic issue. So we're not wasting food, not because we're worried about what it's going to do to the environment. We're not wasting food because we don't have money um, and we're not in a position to waste food. And they just use guilt as a way to do it. Um, so I think that's our greatest challenge is how do we get people to see that they should not put that food um, in the garbage? And so again, going back to one of the, the ways that we did that was really to help them think about um, their food and think about how much money they could save and how, um, how they should purchase instead of buying processed foods that have um, all the packaging, et cetera, um, that we should really think about what it looks like to purchase, store, and prepare food so that we don't have the food waste. So similar to what they talked about in the film about freezing food, which we don't do a lot of now. So teaching people how to properly freeze food, because you can, you know, freeze the food and if you're not putting in the in the freezer properly, then it'll go bad and you have food waste. So just re really helping them think about the ways that they could reduce waste and the way that they manage their lifestyle. So we really made it a lifestyle type um, program and motivated them with their health. We created an app where they were able to track their food waste. So um, 
the food too good to waste challenge allowed everybody that participated to basically track how much food they were throwing away over a six week period. And then using the strategies that we taught them about how to shop, prepare and store their food, they were able to um, reduce their food waste. And so people saw, you know, they lost weight. They were able to reduce their food waste in each home by, you know, for some people up to seven pounds a week. Um, and so it really helped them understand that whole idea of food waste. But how do we then take that and scale that um, where it works? The, and so as we were doing that, we were, you know, directing people to compost on their own. But again, to David's point, um, really about thinking about circularity, that's not the best use of that food waste. So how do we, so we also told them about collabor, um, you know, cooperative and how to create a cooperative among your friends. So you guys, you know, share and eat dinner together so you don't have food waste. So all of these were strategies because at this point, one of the greatest challenges for us in being able to get the food waste out is that we don't have a way to collect it and a way to process it from their homes. And so we need funding to be able to do that. And we also need political will at the local level that will, it, that will allow us to uh, implement a program as such. I love that. And I love the sense of community um, in getting neighbors. We can't share food right now, but getting neighbors and community members to, to share food together. And we are um, at our church. We have a garden and um, have composted at the garden for a while. But now we're starting to have um, people who live close to the church bring um, their food scraps in. But like you said, um, it's better not to get there. It's better to have to use it first. And um, I think it's it's really interesting that you're teaching people how to um, store food properly because I had to go and teach myself. And I, I did a lot of Googling and a lot of trying to figure out, I even couldn't figure out which part of the refrigerator, like, um, what when we when we moved, what refrigerator to buy. And I tell you what, they don't make a refrigerator for people who eat a lot of fresh food. You know, it doesn't have enough drawers to save everything. So, so I've gotten creative, but that is something that that um, that I had to teach myself. Okay, we're gonna go to David. Um, this one says your business has many partnerships, which include local restaurants and nonprofits. Could you please share with us some of your positive experiences of these partnerships? And yeah. A question. Sorry, a follow-up question to that. Someone wanted to know if you were expanding to neighborhoods. You you might under, understand. So uh, neighborhoods, yes. I mean, our ninety percent of our customers are houses, um, and we we are looking for partnerships both with neighborhoods and apartments to kind of build density. It's all about density. You know, the fewer miles we can drive per customer, better gotcha. for us, better for the what they said was other neighborhoods. <laughs> They must live somewhere that you don't serve. Gotcha. So yeah, we serve most of Mecklenburg County. We're probably in the next one to two years going to be in maybe some of parts of Concord and down to Fort Mill. Um, we have a forum where you can let us know that you want us to come to you and we kind of add those people up and then we get to a you know critical mass will expand. So please contact us. But um, on, your, on your first question for uh, partnerships with nonprofits and restaurants, um, really, I mean, restaurants, it's just a natural fit. I mean, they, it's where we get our, it's where we eat a lot of food uh, outside of grocery stores. Um, and so what we've seen with restaurants is typically, uh, companies, restaurants that are like-minded that are into local food, into farm to table, um, organics. Um, it's just, it's a natural fit for them to not want to waste, not want to just put food in the, to, to the landfill if they're not able to use it. Like the movie talked about, you know, restaurants aren't super guilty of it because they have a pretty tight margin they have to meet in order to make money. So they're not going to as likely to toss the food in the first place. But um, we've, we found some good um, kind of uh, co-marketing there with, with restaurants, uh, similar audiences that care about composting also tend to eat or drink coffee at the companies that we work with. Awesome. Um, early in the field, Dr. Carey asked a question um, wanting to know, how can a consumer gain access to this food locally at a bargain price? And is there some, is, is this something that I should say to my local grocer? And my um, immediate thought was absolutely. The first time I watched Just Eat It, um, the town of Cary where I live had um, 
filmed it and I stood up at the end and I said, you know, we've got this new Earth Fair, Earth Fair which sadly isn't here anymore, but we had Earth Fair come down the street and I found out that they were throwing out all of their food waste. And I, I asked a question about that in the during the film. And the manager of that store that week told me that he was bombarded with people coming in and saying, can I dumpster dive in your trash can? And um, why are you throwing out food waste? And several months later, he came back to me. He ran down the aisle and found me in the aisle. And he said, I want you to know we found somewhere, something to do with our food waste. And they had partnered with a, um, a local church that was, um, was um, doing a pantry. So yes, definitely talk to your um, talk to your grocer and ask them what they can do. So a, a follow up question um, for Representative Hawkins, um, specifically, what what are the incentives that you are talking about for businesses not to create food waste in HB one 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 nine? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things, and that's um, after we filed a bill last uh, last term, and sometimes you file bills so that you can start the conversation. Um, and I didn't want to wait uh, until we everything came together um, in the first term, but to see if we could find um, the positive stakeholders and the potential opponents. Um, and then people who uh, in the General Assembly that have passion for making sure that this, something like this um, became a better bill. Um, and so one of, the, one of the things that we found in our research and working with some of the national groups is um, some states were able to incentivize and that's if they gave away a certain amount because as he mentioned, they know what their margins are. They know exactly how much they can and can't give away, but to, to make sure that every business participates and every large generator participates, one thing I forget the state, that's what I was just looking for, um, actually uh, you know, gave an, a tax incentive so that, that they could propel those companies to do it, right? Because that's, that's the love language for business. And sometimes in this case, uh, whereas food insecurity and making sure we feed the hungry, making sure we save the environment is our love language. That's the thing that I've had to, I've realized through this is that each part of this has to speak um, to a particular industry. And so that's, that's sort of um, where that has taken, um, that's sort of where we are. And that's what we're gonna place into the bill that we filed this go round. And that's why, as I mentioned before, in talking to the, the Restaurants Association, talking to um, the, the, uh, the folks in waste management, um, talking to the ag community, like what do you need in this bill to help make it a reality? Um, because it's always gonna be a detractor, but that's the partial portion of it that we have to work towards. But uh, to everything that they, both of them were saying before, that's why this bill is so important is because it creates a statewide structure. It's beautiful what they're doing um, on a local level and growing and expanding it. But we need to make that framework available to every single city and county across the state. And, and even for, when you mentioned the, uh, the supermarkets, et cetera, with this kind of bill, they'll have some sort of instruction. Does that make sense to do the right thing? So that if a, a carton of milk, you know, is, is supposed to expire on January 31st, there could be a place for it to go after that, right? There can be a pathway and a framework for them to, to do the right thing um, and to make sure that they can get credit for it um, in so many ways. So I appreciate that question. And um, I, I really hope that that's the part of the bill that we can uh, get to put this over the edge. Well, and it's good to hear that you're you're going back at it again. I think that was one of our follow-up questions as well. Um, <clears throat> speaking to incentives, um, Baptiste Dubanche, Dubanche is an activist in France that we've we've hosted here in Cary. He, it's a crazy story, but he rode his pedal bike across the ocean for four months to bring um, um, attention to the issue of food waste and Best Buy dates. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he recently, um, France did start um, offering ta tax incentives to restaurants. He said there was another little issue that came out of that though, that it almost made it too easy for them Mm -hmm. to get rid of it. So he had some ideas for building something else in there. Um, you might want to chat with him. No, um, I'll be glad to. I'm impressed by him already. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's pretty cool. Um, so I think this question could go for anybody. Um, we're wondering what is the most effective way we can get municipalities to invest in composting systems or other ways to reduce food waste? Yeah, I would say one thing that I learned from Durham, and I know the other ones, you know, have more experience with this than I do, is that if we're going, especially for this bill, what I realized is that 
you know, we're going to have to make sure that we have more money and more resources put into local infrastructure to make this happen. Um, uh, because, you know, you'd be surprised where your trash <laughs> goes and how far it goes from your municipality. And I know a lot of folks in this know about that. And so they talked about the cost of being able to haul um, just is going to, it would make it astronomical and make it not worth it. And so if we're gonna have, we're gonna have to have, you know, organic recyclers and, um, and, and landfills in a uh, more proximate um, to city centers and to where the waste is being produced. So I would say that's the one thing that, that I've learned in the way that we can best support um, our um, localities uh, with the bill that I'm proposing. Anyone else want to speak to that? Um, I would I would just add that um, there's I think something to consider. And uh, Brandy mentioned political will, obviously difficult. And I'm sure, you know, Representative Hawkins, you're overly familiar with the problem of political will. But um, with when it comes to landfills, you know, yes, composting and expanding composting facilities or other avenues for for food waste diversion is more expensive now relative to landfilling. You know, what are the ex externalities? What are the other costs of landfills? What's the future cost of landfills? Yeah. And how can we incorporate that into the accounting uh, now and, and expedite those um, incentives and, and public funding if needed? Um, so I'll just leave it there. Brady, did you wanna say anything? <laughs> oh, you're muted. Hmm. I wonder if I've got you. Sorry. Um, I, I think David kind of hit it. Like, as I said, we embarked on this composting pilot because as we were doing um, healthy communities and the food too good to waste program, we recognized that there was a better way to, um, you know, that we need, that we really needed to provide a solution for people um, because them composting on their own really wasn't going to work. And we were starting, um, as David mentioned, this whole circular economy project, um, but there still needed to be a curbside solution that so to give people direct action they could do from their homes. Um, and it's always about, you know, where's the funding coming from? Because, you know, we, we have to have trucks, we got a people, um, and then we need a processor that's close because we were actually driving um, out of town to take the food waste. So the cost of the pilot let us know, you know, helped us realize that it was just financially not feasible for us to have a curbside program at the time and maintain our recycling program. Um, and so it's always about where, where are you going to go? And because again, most people understand recycling because it has been the way that we've managed waste for so long, there really is going to have to be a huge mindset shift um, and that's when, when I talked about scaling up. So the things that people learn through our program, how do we scale that program up to start shifting that mindset? So I think, you know, two things, we're going to need um, funding to do that whole work of awareness and mindset shift, and then the funding to be able to get to um, curbside programs. But again, there's so many things that we should do before we even get there. But we, once we have that, once we're at the place where we're um, we're needing to uh, compost, we have to have a way for people to do that. And right now we don't. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> our carry compost team, we're trying to move my town to curbside compost and working with the local government. We happened to tour um, NC State's facility. Um, they NC State composts all of theirs on, on campus. And it's a small facility, but it's it's amazing. And um, to, to, to repre what Representative Hawkins said, getting um, composting facilities closer to where we need them to be, it, I'm, I'm realizing, well, it'd be really cool if we just had a lot of these in, in different areas. It seems like that that's a good direction to move. Um, I wanted to follow up with Brandy on, um, on your landfill in Charlotte. I, I don't know a whole lot about it. Wake County is due to hit capacity um, by 2040 and there's no plan B here. And so we're, we're looking at it pretty, pretty quick. Um, I'm curious how you guys are. So we, um, the landfill, it does have an expiration date, you know, the 
the target keeps moving. I've heard 15, 10 years, uh, whatever it is, it's very close, right? Those That time's going to come very soon. And so I think part of the commitment to the circular economy was for us to think about what else we could do with that way. So not just composting, but how do we maintain the highest possible value of the thing that we're finding in the landfill? So as David talked about, really thinking about how, you know, um, doing a proof of concept for this whole idea of using food waste for black fly larvae to then feed livestock. So I'm um, thinking about the circularity of it. So we're right now that the entire uh, circular economy project that we're working on um, in conjunction with Envision Charlotte is helping us to reimagine what it could look like for us to have alternatives that um, allow us to become a circular city and so we're not just landfilling, composting, but we're uh, really thinking about the afterlife and the pre-production and helping to shift that mindset here locally. Gotcha, awesome, good. Well, we're, we're getting close to, to needing to wrap up. Um, I think we're gonna try to fit a couple more questions in and then I'll have each of the panelists go around and, and um, give some closing, some last closing thoughts. Um, but there is a question about contamination and I'm, I don't, I'm not sure who's best, maybe David or Brandy best to answer that. Um, contamination and food, um, food packaging and compost. Yeah, um, so in our case, um, and I put it in a comment in some detail if, if I uh, miss anything while I'm speaking. Um, a lot of our customers who clearly took the, the, took the effort and um, spent the money to pay for our service, um, don't, they, we really don't have too many problems from residential customers. Um, our restaurant customers, we're, we're collecting in some cases um, 600 pounds a week. You've got, you know, different shifts, different cooks and waiters and waitresses kind of throwing things in the bin. And so occasionally we get gloves, we get ramekins, we get bottles. Um, those get filtered out fairly easily. Um, I would say probably the larger problem when it comes to composting in particular, um, and, and I think it's a, it's a problem for recycling as well, is the compostable plastics industry and plastics that are not recyclable in general. It's just, it's a, it's a super confusing for someone like me who thinks about this like six hours a day and for somebody who just like, what do I do with this thing? Don't, you know, it doesn't even cross their mind. Um, and then there's people who care like y'all and you're buying compostable plastic and it's like, oh, well now I can't, I can't compost it in my backyard. Um, and then, well, oh, it's biodegradable. It's not compostable. It's just, there's so many confusing things and it's definitely not recyclable if it's compostable. So I would kind of, uh, that's a larger topic, but people should be thinking about, you know, what, what plastics they're using as well. Absolutely. There, I'll just give a little shout out for a new app called Plastic Score, which allows you to, to um, score the plastics coming out of restaurants that you eat at. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll change some social, social norms there as well. Um, and I think it, you all kind of were, were leading or, or, or speaking to the fact that we have these, this valuable resource, food, that, um, you know, it is not waste until it's wasted. And so if we could get people to change their mindset around food being food being waste, um, that would solve a lot of our problem. So um, each of you, I'm gonna have you answer this question. And then if you wanna go ahead while you're answering the question and just give whatever other shout out thing you want to be heard, um, event you might have coming up, whatever, whatever you want us to do, um, let us know. So the question is, what recommendations do you have for attendees on how to reduce their food waste um, or the food that's wasted or that's produced in their community? And we'll start with Allison. Yeah, sure. Um, I just know that I feel like all of this can feel overwhelming and there's just so much food being wasted and it can be, you know, really stressful at times. But I just want you to think of the things that you can do personally, especially at home. Um, so, you know, just making sure that you plan what you're going to be eating. So a lot of meal prep and, you know, writing down a list and sticking with that list when you go to a grocery store. Food storage definitely is important. If you get one of our boxes in your first box, we actually have a little booklet where it says what stores, like what kind of fruits and vegetables 
store best in these certain environments. So you can see, you know, like, oh, this, you know, this is perfect for this and then it will last longer. So just getting that research and all of that information is important. Using everything, um, you know, just making sure that you're not just, you know, chopping off the tops of the carrots and throwing them out. There's plenty of ways to use, utilize everything, every single part of your produce items. You can make soups, uh, sauces, smoothies, pickle jams, et cetera. And like the movie said, focusing on the freezer, I mean, you can freeze unlikely produce uh, like ginger, onion, garlic, et cetera, and veggie scraps to make herbs for stock. Um, and then composting, like we talked about before, and they could talk about much more than I can. So those are some ways I think that would be really beneficial um, that you can do at home. That's awesome. I love that booklet. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Brandy? Um, so Allison stole a lot of the things that I was going to say. Um, so in our food too good to waste manual, like part of what we were teaching them were se several of the tips that Allison shared in terms of using the entire um, fruit or vegetable, actually buying more produce than you buy anything else and cooking with all of it. So, you know, making sure that you're plan you're doing meal uh, planning for the week, you do your meal prep. And also one thing is not to buy uh, groceries for an entire week, but to think about buying them every couple of days so that your produce doesn't go bad. If you, um, especially if you're extremely busy, like um, a lot of families are, so that you don't, so you're on, you cook every day. You have fresh food every day. It's better for your health, and it also keeps you from uh, having that food waste. So thinking about that, um, and we also encourage them uh, brown bag composting. So how to create, and so if you, you know, the science of composting and the the whole idea is overwhelming for you. Just get you um, a brown bag when you go to the grocery store instead of the plastic bags throw your uh, organic food scraps in there, dig a hole, put it in and cover it back up and just continue to do that in your composting. So um, those are all ways that you can make sure that you're reducing your food waste. But again, like I said, the, the whole idea of cooperative sharing. So, um, you know, even if you're buying, if it's just, I'm going to buy, um, I'll buy because they have it on sale. I'll buy a, in bulk and then I'll share with you. So we, you know, I'll leave a box on the porch. You come pick it up because we're in COVID, but just being able to share um, grocery shopping, food, et cetera. Awesome. I love that brown bag composting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. <laughs> okay. Let's go to David. Yeah. Um, so a couple, couple thoughts. Um, there's another resource that I, I always turn to called savethefood.com. And it's actually just a kind of a compilation of the um, topics discussed by Dana Gunders, who was on the documentary um, with the NRDC. It's, um, it's super quick stats. But the best part about it is that it has like a encyclopedia of food and how to store it. Um, and so you can just click like cucumber and it's like, oh, put this in the fridge. Tomato, don't put that in the fridge. Uh, mushrooms, put them in a paper bag. So just stuff like that. Um, similar to, to um, Allison's manual, which sounds awesome. Um, so check that out. Uh, it kind of hits all the points that the documentary talked about. And another thing that the documentary mentioned that we haven't really covered is um, like hidden resources, like the amount of water that it takes to grow the corn or the grass that it took to make a pound of beef, you know? That, to keep, keep that in mind as well, because, you know, like, like they said, you know, when you're throwing away a leftover burger, it's a much larger environmental impact than leftover ear of corn. Um, so there's other, other things to think about there, too, in terms of dietary choices. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And Representative Talk Hawkins. Yeah, sure. No, they, they, they've literally covered it all, um, which, is, which is great. And so that sort of just gives me the, the opportunity to... Um, to say that, you know, one of the things that I think is important is sort of moving to the education of it. And she talked about the, you know, building the community. So if you know something, you know, sp spread that in your HOA, in your neighborhood. Um, talk to your school board about ways that, uh, you know, schools can start the process of doing uh, composting and food share tables and those sorts of things so that we can make this a continuous cycle uh, of people being a part of this community and wanting to do it. 
um, find places that need food um, that you can carry it so it does not go to waste. Um, I have three boys in my house, luckily, so food does not last long in my house. Um, and we do smoothies, as Allison mentioned, um, with every part of every piece of produce. And so those things are those things are important, but they um, sometimes, uh, and I think I want to say Brandy mentioned this, they sometimes come to people who know better and have access to information. And so we have to sort of each one teach one um, to that. Uh, so what I'll do is, as you mentioned uh, before, Lee, I can you know move on to sort of some of the shout outs here and uh, definitely want to shout out everyone who took the time to learn about this. This is a very um, committed community uh, of people who care about the environment, care about food and security, care about um, you know, food waste reduction. And so that, that I'm part, you know, glad to be a part of. And a couple of ways that you can join the work, um, shout out to David and mentioning plastics. I do have a bill that's uh, along with Representative Harrison that sink, ban single use plastics in the state of North Carolina. And so we need that kind of, um, uh, you know, support. Um, if you remember, um, you know, the Attorney General a while ago, you know, moved to remove plastic bags from our grocery stores. Like those are the kinds of things that we absolutely need to do to make sure that we are uh, adding on to the efforts of organic recycling uh, and food waste reduction. Uh, the second thing is I'll put my email in the chat. Um, you know, email me if you want to join this food waste task force. Um, and you know, everyone that has joined so far, um, as we have been having conversations, have brought, has brought something to the table. And so um, we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to contribute in that and, you know, and some of the ideas that are floating. Some we may realize are opportunities that are low hanging fruit. Like one state just did a food waste task force with their governor and they had a food waste prevention day. Right. I mean, it's small steps like that is what they did. And so we, we may have to take those steps in order to get our state uh, into that place. And, um, and then the other last thing, as I said this before, is for those who have it together, adopt another town too. Um, though I represent the city and county of Durham, House District 31, the coolest district in the state of North Carolina with RTP, um, I am from a very small town of 800 people. And so if you are near a place where you have those kinds of connections, make sure you connect with a smaller community so they can learn these skills. Thank you so much for having me tonight. This has been amazing. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathleen. Kathleen, welcome back. She uh, loved you. her in that a little bit earlier. But that's yes. Um, I just, on the behalf of Hungry Harvest and Toward Zero Waste, we want to thank our panel members and all the attendees for attending tonight at this event. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our organization, please take a look at our websites. It's hungryharvest.net and towardzerowaste.org. Toward Zero Waste has future events listed on their website. There's also a section on the website to sign up for the Toward Zero Waste newsletters. And if you'd like to volunteer with Toward Zero Waste, please put your name in and we'll be in touch with you. And there's also a section for donations if you feel so called to help our organization that way. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.